as you were. Permit me to introduce myself to you good people, if I may. And my name is Les Patterson. <laughs> and I have the honour to be the Australian Cultural Attaché to the Court of St James. I also have the rare distinction of being the first official failure of the Betty Ford Foundation. <laughs> The last two weeks I've been in the lap of luxury in the old BFF, as we inmates are inclined to call it. But ten minutes after I was discharged, I was in the local rubbery as full as a pommy complaint box. <laughs> <laughs> and that's chock a block, no worries. <laughs> but I felt no pain. I'm enjoying every minute of it. Good luck to you, Betty, and all at the BFF. And you can't win them all, darling. Anyway, we've got a star-studded audience tonight. Here's to the celebs in the audience and the odd pommy politico, too. And you'd have to be pretty odd to be a pom politician. <laughs> no Ladies and gentlemen, oh, I'm not going to hang around up here like a fart in a phone box. For a <laughs> sit down and shut up. I'm going to sit down and shut up and I'm going to take the cotton wool out of my ears. I'm going to stuff it in my mouth. No worries, because... <laughs> Because I want to introduce you people to a little lady who's done a good deal more than Liz Patterson to put Australia on the map, to drag Oz into the, into the mid-80s, kicking and screaming. We've really come a long way, and we're in the big league now. We've got the lot. We've got political corruption. We've got organised crime, <laughs> second to none. And we're investing big bickies, I can tell you, to encourage uh, world-class football hooliganism, <laughs> McDonald's, AIDS and rampant transvestitism. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the future looks rosy and every man, woman and child in Australia is looking forward to terrorism, racial violence and cable television. How about that? <laughs> but uh, now it's my duty to introduce a lady who... who's Australian. <laughs> How does that... Oh, <laughs> oh, there I go again! I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I'm breaking down, but I wouldn't be a red-blooded Australian statesman, elder statesman, if I, if I didn't shed the odd droplet. Please forgive me, I'm pretty big in the waterworks department, as the ladies might have noticed. And uh, my, little, my little girl Friday, my uh, research assistant the other night after five Gallianos, she said to me, she said, Les... She said, you've got the biggest lacrimal duct I've ever come across. <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah, I'm an old softy, not that the women would notice. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, and with the best yet to come, I'd like you to put your hands together for the Melbourne mother, megastar and millionaireess. Yes, it's the caring and sharing Dame Edna Everidge. Let's hear it for you. and get too emotional like that unsavoury creature who just introduced me. <laughs> Must I? I've got to keep my cool tonight because it's an event. It's another event a few years ago, many moons ago now. I allowed myself to be probed by a celebrity audience <laughs> in these London weekend studios. I said, anything goes, I'll let it all hang out. <laughs> and... Uh, of course, that's now television history, isn't it? It's become a little classic. Little people made pirate videos of it. <laughs> it's being used in schools, all that kind of thing. <laughs> and I'm in the hot seat again tonight. London Weekend, I know, tried that little experiment with a few other so-called celebrities. And frankly, 
Frankly, I mean this in a nice way. The magic didn't work. It didn't. <laughs> I'm not going to name names. I don't need to, do I, darling? <laughs> but tonight, of course, it's going to work again because this is what's called peer group therapy, isn't it? I'm here <laughs> with my peer group. Well, you're all sitting there peering at me anyway. <laughs> and uh, that's my definition of a peer group. And we've got little celebrities here tonight, of course. They mightn't be celebrities everywhere. I, I mean this nicely, but if this show goes out <laughs> by satellite, say, to Venezuela or Newfoundland or even Tasmania, <laughs> frankly, those of you who deem yourself to be celebrities will mean absolutely nothing. <laughs> The chances are I'll be the only person they recognise. <laughs> but there are a couple... Well, there are several categories of celeb, aren't they? There are sort of what I call AM celebrities and FM celebrities. <laughs> uh, you know, some of their little beams don't always travel as far as they might, but that doesn't matter, does it? Because we all enjoy ourselves. Of course, there are some people here that I won't recognise. I'm sorry. I, I'll, I'll try to. I'll pretend I recognise you. <laughs> the chances are I won't know you from Adam, though. <laughs> I might, and there are some people here too who you might recognise, they could be my heavies. They could be. Because naturally, I mean, I have little security problems and the audience is bristling with a few little heavies of mine, my little minders. I don't mean this in a sort of awful way, but I hope you enjoy yourselves. If you, if you don't appear to enjoy yourselves, because they can take the law into their own hands. <laughs> they can. Well, you could find yourself at the bottom of Sydney Harbour if you don't like it. <laughs> You'd, you probably wouldn't reach the bottom. You'd be eaten by a shark first. <laughs> but uh, a lot of people have urged me uh, to go up market a bit. You know, I, I had a reputation of being a comedian for quite... Oh, look at me, being a bit of... Mod <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? Um, I had a bit of a reputation for being a comedian, which I... <laughs> Not really. People said to me, David, why do you always have to be funny? Why can't you be like other Australian comedians? And I've thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> A lovely warm mood. I'm in one of my gorgeous moods. I don't, as I say, need to do it because I'm not really a professional. I don't need to tell you this. I was born with a precious gift in Melbourne. I'm an Australian, incidentally. <laughs> I was born in Melbourne with a priceless gift. Uh, Dame Nature must have stooped over my little bassinet and <laughs> gave me this gift. It was the ability, the priceless ability, to laugh at the misfortunes of others. And you know, <laughs> I can tell you, that, it, that keeps me cheerful 24 hours a day. <laughs> Open. I've been chatting twice as long as I should have because this is a sharing evening. This is where we share, isn't it? And so I'm going to use a very, very wonderful expression of the 1980s now. I'm going to say, Suck it to me, possums! <laughs> <laughs> Look at them all. Yes, you. It's Dame Kiri, you gorgeous thing. And can I say to you this, my little kiwi, my precious little golden-voiced one. Can I say this to you before you ask me your little probing question? <laughs> that I put you up for that little dame hood. I did. <laughs> My little friend, I did, I said. <laughs> the powers that be, who'll be watching this, by the way, and they'll be so grateful for my discretion, but they said to me, who else but you? Is there any other Antipodean songbird? And I said, there's little Kiri, there is. <laughs> Goodness, we're proud of you, darling. What's your question? Thank you very much. <laughs> I wondered if you were uh, ever at all interested in maybe opera or operetta, and uh, what do you think about the Merry Widow? Would it suit you? Well, <laughs> it... <laughs> well, it almost would, Kiri. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, my husband is still with us. He is. <laughs> Enough, I'm wearing Norm's watch. 
I am. This is Norm's watch, and I think I must be probably the only woman in the world who wears a husband's watch while he's still alive. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> but, uh, but opera. Oh, yes, I'm into that. I, of course, the operas I love are the ones you're in, Kiri, and I'm not just saying that. Well, yes, I, in fact, I am. <laughs> See, I can't tell a fib, can I? I have to be direct, terrifically direct type of a woman. Too direct sometimes, you know. I, I'm going to come out with a few things tonight that might even give offence. I'm sorry if I do. I wouldn't I'd mean it. I'll mean it nice. If I insult you, I'll, I'll do it nicely, I promise you. And you'll, you'll, in a way, you'll forgive me afterwards. Kiri, I love the opera, and there are parts in the theatre too that I'd like to do. I am, in a way, an actress. I've been accepted by the theatre. But uh, I don't know. I'm basically, I think, an amateur. I'm just a person, I'm a sort of. Phenomenon, I suppose you'd say. <laughs> Funny me that I can actually speak of myself in that objective way. That constantly astonishes me. <laughs> yes, the little... Oh, hello, Clive. How are you? One of my fellow Australians. A little protégé of mine, too, if I may say so. <laughs> Thanks very much, Aunt Edna. I wonder if I could... Uh, wonder if I could ask an intimate question about uh, you and your husband, Norm. Uh, we know that you and he have always been. We know that you and he have always been deeply in love, and that he's been a solid pillar of fidelity to you and you to him over the years and indeed the decades. But I wonder if. <laughs> I didn't I know if... I had a guest artist on the show. <laughs> I'm just getting to the peroration now, aren't I? But, but I wonder if your eyes ever strayed. I wonder if you've, you've ever been attracted to other men than Norman. I wonder what attracts you in other men. What sort of men are you uh, attracted to? I am attracted to other men, Clive. You've asked me a direct question and I'm answering you very, very directly on the media in front of all these people. Yes! <laughs> juices, as I've mentioned before. <laughs> and my husband has been, has not been a well person for many, many years. Oh, most amusing. <laughs> Let me know when your loved ones are in intensive care. Let me know. <laughs> I'll come along and have a good old chuckle at you. <laughs> But I, I do. I rather like shortish men. I do, Clive. I do. I mean, in a way, you can't get enough of them, can you? <laughs> I, I like men I can look down on, like, uh, oh, like little Roman Polanski. You did an interview with him. He's a little precious little thing, isn't he, in his spooky little way? And I like uh, Lord Snowden. He's gorgeous, too. He's of diminished stature. And I like, uh, of course, little Charles Aznavour could dance in the old-fashioned way with me any time he liked. I love little Charles. Sometimes dream about him, as a matter of fact. <laughs> but Norm, you know, I have to tell you, I, I felt a little while ago that I hadn't made enough sacrifices somehow because I've been given so much. What have I given? I often think. That's why I'm here, for heaven's sake. But... I thought, what have I given for the conservation of energy, for example? I thought, I've given nothing. I've done nothing to conserve energy. And then it hit me. I thought, there's one thing I can do. I can have Norm taken off his life support system. <laughs> I did. I did. It was a big decision. It was a big decision. It was a big decision, but I did it. <laughs> I did it gladly. I did it, in a way, gratefully. The spooky thing that happened after that was that he came good. Now, he'd been... <laughs> he, he, he made a miracle recovery. He'd been using that as a crutch, if you don't mind me using that word. <laughs> he did, and he's, he's now getting around the hosie on a frame, and there's talk. There is talk of him coming home. Now, this is a big shock. It's a big adjustment that I have to make. Because he's asked for his clothes, and of course I... Well, I gave them to the Salvation Army years ago. I mean, years ago. His golf clubs have been all my daughter Nora's turned them into a mandala. She's melted them into them. She's made contemporary sculpture of them. His Masonic trowel, I wouldn't know where it was. It's going to lead to so many... He wants me to be, you know, 
his chattel again. He wants to manage me. He wants to get rid of Barry Humphreys as my manager. There's another problem. Of course, Norm has wanted to handle me for years, Clive, but I never thought he was well enough, and I don't think he is now. <laughs> but there it is. Isn't life funny? These little changes, you know, that have happened to you, just when you've practically written someone off. <laughs> yes, darling, you. you. At the back, in the black, first of all. Well, you've been talking about Norm Day, Medra, and I have been worried quite a lot about him. It does seem to me that you have perhaps been just a little indulging yourself, you know, superstarring around the world while he was there, sort of prostrate with his prostate down under. I mean, <laughs> where do you think you should have been by his side? Well, I was there as often as I could. Why do you think I haven't been on the media much lately? <laughs> You've hardly ever seen me. I've been there in my tracksuit, sitting there looking at my watch. <laughs> Darling, there's a limit to what you can do. I've tried to amuse him, but you can't really over-entertain an institutionalised loved one. I must tell you what we gave Norm for Christmas. I had his bedside drip re-chromed. I didn't know that And the nurses, they put holly all the way up the tube. And they filled it with brandy butter, too. Apparently that doesn't do them any harm. But I must also tell you, because... There would be people, even celebrities, with institutionalised loved ones. And what do you do? What jokes do you play on them on April Fool's Day? And I... It is a problem, isn't it? Because you want to amuse them and you don't want to necessarily finish them off. So I'll... <laughs> I'll tell you what joke we played on Norm, Claire. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Claire, we... Uh, it's a lovely trick and you could play it on your loved ones. We pretended to him. <laughs> We pretended to him that he was going to be discharged from the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> the sister packed his suitcase. <laughs> she put it in his private room so he could see, he could watch her doing it in the mirror above his page turning machine. <laughs> They got him into the dressing gown, the one we thought he'd never wear, Kerry. Took all they say, apparently they can put the pins back in it. Anyway, they got him down. <laughs> Clear, they got him down to the front steps of the Hossie about three quarters of an hour later. And there was the ambulance sticking over. And just as Norm practically fell into the ambulance, oh, oh, <laughs> it whizzed off down the hospital windows said April Fool! <laughs> and I only wish that Norm could have laughed at that as well. <laughs> but I'm accountable. I, that's the new word, isn't it? Arthur, hello darling. And I love your book, Arthur Marshall. I do. I really, there's a laugh at every line, darling. Your good news. There are a lot of people who are good news, and you're definitely very high on my list of good news people, Thank you, Arthur Marshall. Imagine. I'm sure there's something bubbling up in your mind that you want to ask me. Dear, I wanted to ask, your mastery of words is so extraordinary, and we all admire it so greatly. Are you yourself a great bookworm? I am, Arthur, I do. I love... Well, even as a youngster, when I was a very young girl and I first started to grow hair I could sit on, you know, I was always... <laughs> with a torch. I was. <laughs> oh, I was. And then one day our family doctor suggested I give it up and take up reading and I've never... <laughs> honestly, I've never looked back or up. <laughs> I haven't. I love... I've got my nose into something pretty interesting most of the time. Little Beryl... <laughs> little Beryl Bainbridge's latest is pretty good too. I adore that. But I'm... All kinds of literature I like and... Too, little your little magazine, Private Eye, which has been pretty kind to me, Richard, if I may say so. I've never had occasion to sue you. I must be one of the few. <laughs> <laughs> but there it is. I don't think you'd take me on. I don't think even Richard would take me on because I'd be a formidable foe, wouldn't I, darling? Wouldn't I? <laughs> but keep up the good work with those little fingers. Have they commissioned a sequel yet, Arthur? No, not not yet. yet. No, but you could name your figure now, couldn't you? Yeah. And you had all those years of obscurity. <laughs> and there you are, sitting next to the adorable...
adorable Margaret, Duchess of Argyle. Hello, <laughs> Margaret. How are you, darling? Lovely to see you. Looking gorgeous, of course. I love the little frock, too. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's lovely. You're very fortunate the woman who lent it to you was your size, darling. <laughs> Yes, darling, you gorgeous creature, aren't you? Lovely? Your beauty is a secret. Well, I mean, you're looking at it, darling, aren't you? <laughs> you are. I hope it's not too much of a secret. I'm very, very lucky with my looks. I'm not a classic beauty. I'm not. I'm sorry, but I'm not. Many have said so, but I'm not. I do pamper myself, though. I use some of our precious marsupials, our Australian marsupials. <laughs> some of their little emanations and <laughs> some of their lovely secretions. It's very difficult, I'm afraid, to get wombat milk at Fortnum and Mason. <laughs> it is. But whenever I can, I rub it into my little nooks and crannies and crevices. <laughs> But I'm lucky. I'm lucky with my skin. I've got beautiful skin. You can feel it after the show if you want to. <laughs> and viewers too. I pity you won't be able to touch me. A lot of people do want to. And I should say now, I know this is an answer to a question, but I'm perhaps anticipating it. I am not a healer. I'm not. I haven't those powers. I've got powers. I don't think you'd be here, would you? Let's face it. You wouldn't be here drinking in my words if I didn't have spooky old powers, would you? <laughs> but I can't heal. I cannot heal. Though, <laughs> I must say after the last show I did here, they found a battered crutch under one of the seats. <laughs> the cleaners did. <laughs> they did. So someone must have walked home laughing, don't you think? <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me in the least if there weren't a few old crutches going begging here tonight. And <laughs> I'm almost certain there are. <laughs> Look at Edna Healy laughing at me. <laughs> Hello, darling Edna. My little namesake. You know, you've done such a lot too, not just for your marvellous little husband there. <laughs> but you've done a lot in your own right for people and things, and yet I suppose if the honours list came along, Did would you that? accept a damehood, do you think, darling? <laughs> would you? Is me asking you a question. <laughs> You'd be Dame Edna the second, wouldn't Can you? I? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. And Dennis, look, what? please, before I forget it, I've got this camera. I can't get the film out of this, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> you think? Afterwards. <laughs> the camera watching this. You're a bit of a photography buff. Could you get it out after? It's in a dark room. Uh, if you'll join me in the dark room, oh. dear. <laughs> I will, of course, if yes, you don't we mind, could make Edna. wonderful music together. <laughs> could I ask you a question? Yes, certainly. <laughs> is it without notice? <laughs> it is, actually. I mean, you've shown such delicacy, sensitivity, <laughs> and refinement this evening. I understand your loyalty to Norm, but have you never thought of making music with Sir Leslie Patterson? <laughs> well, what? I think I'm going to have to think about that, don't you? No, I haven't, Dennis. Of course not. What a facetious thing to say. <laughs> He's not at all typical of Australia, and he lets down the side very badly indeed, Dennis. And I think you're giving him unnecessary publicity. Your comments then will be flashed around the world, do you really? <laughs> Probably on one of the very few occasions they will be. <laughs> been worried about you. <laughs> I love that little neo-beatnik look, don't you? <laughs> well, here we are again after a little commercial break. And 
And, of course, for those of you who have just tuned in, it's Dame Edna Everidge, housewife superstar, mother megastar and millionaire, is doing a bit of caring and sharing with a, a so-called celebrity audience. <laughs> yes, hello, darling. You are gorgeous, too, oh, aren't thank you? you? Thank and you you're very not a token person, are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 no. What I'm doing is preempting the cynics who'll say, oh, Dame Edna had a few little token tinteds in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they say that sort of yucky thing. You're media folk, you know what scurrilous little things they say. <laughs> and we know you're not, though I have got the odd token Caucasian here. <laughs> <laughs> No pack drill. Yes, darling. And I love the way you've just hurled that thing across your neck. I'm learning from you. I love your little bit of the ice blue you're wearing too, aren't you? Dame Edna. <clears throat> With... <laughs> well, she a got lady. the name right, anyway. <laughs> Such as you are, I would say what like what you are if I was in Birmingham, but I'm in London. Do you ever get do you ever get the time a lady so busy, a dame, to cook? Do you get the chance to cook? Oh, very little. I know you're a culinary expert, aren't you, darling? <laughs> I've seen those little fingers rummaging and all sorts of things on my screen. <laughs> cook much it's sad my domestic life has receded a bit <laughs> heavens above I've got the drives and juices of a housewife I'm, I'm, I, am a housewife. I am I'm basically that I'm not even a member of Actors Equity I shouldn't say that <laughs> because this crew will probably walk out won't you? <laughs> you won't though because you adore me <laughs> no I am liked I'm, I am adored I can say that and it doesn't sound creepy, does it? Isn't that funny? <laughs> the reason is it's true. That's the main thing. But I don't get much of a chance. I run up little snacks and things for myself. I I'm into croissants. Croissants. They're the latest thing, you know. They're a little French invention, of course. But they're the very latest little Margot Hemingway looking at me. Look at your face as a picture, darling. You are. And I'm sure, I'm sure our little grandfathers would have got on pretty well together, as a matter of fact. Old Grandpa Everidge liked a bit of fishing. Anyway, <laughs> and Scott Fitzgerald, he would have adored if he'd ever heard of him. <laughs> People, I'm into them. But uh, to return to your rather commonplace little question, now. <laughs> I'm into croissants, croissants, all kinds of things. Did you know they're in? They're the latest. Not even, perhaps they haven't come to Birmingham yet, but <laughs> you can put anything in them. I like kiwi fruit and Vegemite croissant. <laughs> I don't like it. As a matter of fact, it's absolutely vile, darling, but no one's ever had one before, and I think a little first. Sometimes it's amazing what people will choke down if they've never tried it. Isn't it? <laughs> think about that for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Oh, that little gentleman next to Margaret. Yes, you were... Well, I was going to ask about your mother. How is she? Oh, my mother, she's a marvel. My mother, as you possibly know, is in a maximum security twilight home. <laughs> <laughs> she's... <laughs> she's in the only twilight home in the southern hemisphere with an electric fence, possibly. <laughs> and she sits there... She does, Dennis. She sits there in her wheelchair, throwing Tupperware at the wire. <laughs> she does, and the sparks fly. People drive for miles to see it. It's like uh, satellites and things. It is. And, uh, oh, it's absolutely beautiful. They've, as a matter of fact, they've, uh, they've put my mother on a retainer and they've earthed her chair. She's got... <laughs> She brought business to the home. That's what I call caring on an institutional level. But she is a wonder. She's been trying to tunnel out lately. She has been a bit sad since she's on the third floor. <laughs> but she's been reading those Colditz books and things of that kind. She's wonderful. Thank you so much indeed for asking. <laughs> for asking about my mother because I'm very, very fortunate and... She's a marvellous person, you know, when um, she has moments of lucidity. She does. <laughs> yes. Dame Edna, we noticed that uh, round your neck we, uh, you have um, 
what we know in England as the, the insignia of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Does it have the same significance in Australia? Oh, yes, it does, darling. I wasn't sure what this little bauble was, as a matter of fact. I'm glad you've elucidated. But I, I think it does. I don't... Well, I, it's a little... Is it, do you think it's a bit ostentatious? Not meant to be. No, I'll not at all. No, no, no. no. Thank you. Charming. No. <laughs> I feel I should know you, too, somehow. <laughs> I feel I should. Are you heavily disguised tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was Lord Lucan at first. <laughs> no, I did. I, I had a bit of sympathy with the Greenham girls. I was up there, you know, trying to get into their sleeping bags, but unfortunately, <laughs> there wasn't enough room for me. But I hurled a few Sainsbury's pampers at them out of the window of my limo. I involved myself in a f quite a few active things. I'm, I'm busy on, uh, on so many spectra. So many spectra. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I was thinking about Norm. Uh, the question was, well, we talked about my husband a little earlier, but you know, he's been inventing things in the hospital. It's been really remarkable. I first of all, gave him a little bit of... He was knitting at first. I taught him to knit with his mouth. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> they did. He was into oral socks for some reason. <laughs> A pair a day on five needles, not bad. <laughs> but uh, then he's invented this wonderful new, it's a kind of state-of-the-art bedpan. I don't know of a, I don't know of a euphemism for bedpan, so I'm just going to have to say it. I suppose you'd call it an in-bed facility. <laughs> but uh, he's invented this, it's incredible, it's heat-seeking. It's a heat-seeking <laughs> bedpan. <laughs> Apparently it's revolutionary. My husband could be sitting on a fortune. He could be. <laughs> but the patent is pending. I think, you know, he could make a pile out of this. In the he, could. he certainly struck pay dirt with it. There's no two ways about it. So, in a way, my family life has quite revolutionised itself without my intervention whatsoever. My son Kenny, of course. Bless his heart, little Kenny. He's been my favourite. It's wicked, in a way, for a mother to say that, isn't it? But he has always been a favourite of mine, Kenny. And he's, uh, he's had many jobs. He's been in the couture business for some time. Uh, as a matter of fact, he uh, makes the dresses. He sometimes kisses me goodnight. His mouth's still full of pins. <laughs> but, uh, oh. but he could do anything. He was in the airline steward uh, world for a little bit. <laughs> and... Uh, Qantas people, then he went into the British Caledonian because he liked the tartan. <laughs> <laughs> Lately, he's been a screw. He's at the blood, working at the blood bank in Australia at the moment, as a matter of fact. He is, he's a... He's a uh, I don't know quite what he does. I think he's a scrutineer. I said, I said, Kenny, what exactly do you do? He said, I've been trying to tell you that, Mother, for years. He said, he said but it takes one to know one, so I left it at that. I did. I left it at that. You don't ask them too many questions, in a way. You know, and I remember that there were questions I wanted to ask my parents, and I felt a little reticence. Have you ever, did you ever feel that spooky feeling that you couldn't? I did. And years later, I found a book called Human Growth. I did. It was tucked away behind some other books in my parents' home. And I thought, that's the book they wanted to give me. You know, when I ask those little questions that we girls do ask, you know, about little things when your body starts changing. Mine is still in a state of flux, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and Madge Allsop is in a constant state of renewal, you know. It's, <laughs> it's funny, she said to me that she'd bumped into Arthur Scargill at her cosmetic surgeon's the other day. <laughs> and it's such a coincidence because she's having the hair removed from her upper lip and it's been grafted onto his head. <laughs> So it's funny, to think that, it's funny to think that a New Zealand bridesmaid's lip will be on a um, union leader's head one of these days. <laughs> but, uh, poor old Madge, isn't it dreadful? She's had all this cosmetic surgery. She's been landscaped. <laughs> you know, they take, they take tissue of part of the body that nobody looks at. In Madge's case, they use her face. <laughs> She said, I support her, really, I do. I should give her one of a few things. I sit up there and 
first class there, passing down the B-Cal smoked salmon to her, poor love, because I don't want to spoil her. <laughs> Did her husband perish under tragic circumstances, Arthur? Let's see, uh, poor old Doug Allsop, he was... He f well, he was taking a snap, as you were inclined to do, Dennis, on one of the little bridges in Rotorua in New Zealand, and he ah. fell into a mud pool, and unfortunately, though there were a lot of strong swimmers around, none of them had had experience in boiling mud. <laughs> They're holding out cards. Can it be the commercial break already? Please. Well, I, I wanted to ask you, in view of your obvious um, charisma and, and perspicacity and, and your deep if concern... It's obvious, darling. Why mention it? <laughs> <laughs> I have to think of a question. Your deep concern for other people. Have you ever thought of going into politics yourself? Yes, David, I have. I've... <laughs> I have thought about it, particularly Australian politics. I've, uh, it needs... Uh, well, how can I put it? It needs a person of refinement. Let's face it. Because we've got a few little rough diamonds there. <laughs> and uh, there aren't enough women in Australian politics. I have thought of it, but I can't put myself on the line like that. It's, it, look, it's too hard. You know yourself. Look at your fingernails, David, and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> on the face of it, you're relaxed, urbane, and gorgeous-looking. You're a bit dishy, as the younger generation would say, and raunchy, and a little bit on the spunky side. <laughs> 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 oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, look. Sorry, my, my clutch bag keeps snagging with my frock. Isn't it pretty? I'm glad of this lovely frock just as well I can afford it. <laughs> if you put it on that side, it'll only the pantyhose will suffer. <laughs> but, uh, David, I have thought of it, but I just don't think I could keep it up. Incidentally, for those nails of yours, there's an old-fashioned remedy of my mother's. It might be a bit permissive for me to mention, but I suppose it's getting on in the evening now and it won't matter. Dip your fingers in your own little jobs in the morning. <laughs> yes, yes. David, just go in the... Don't switch on the light, just go. <laughs> It'll all happen naturally. <laughs> and then in, in the daytime, when you've got this paper or so, whatever little thing crops up in your life, you'll think it, just as your fingers go to your little... <laughs> you'll think about it. You will. And then if you pop your fingers in your mouth, there'll be something a bit spooky the matter with you. <laughs> It's an old thing, and my mother's got a lot of old things like that. She has, she's full of it, full of it. <laughs> There's your little wife too, hello darling. <laughs> <laughs> little Judy, am I right, Judy? Is that a... Tell me the history of that frock, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely. Is it a furnishing fabric, Judy? Is it... You were very wise to remove the curtain ring, if you know that. <laughs> There's some beautiful frocks here, and there's some interesting ones, too. <laughs> There's a little girl there, and I'm lovely. I like touching. I'm very tactile. Is it all right for the cameras? Do they mind me wandering down here? I'm not doing it for any particular reason. A sort of restlessness. I'm terrifically restless. I am. I want to give you a stroke. What's your name? Lizzie, and you're absolutely delightful, Liz. I like tactile as a word I've been using. I used it uh, for long before the Sunday papers ever took it up. I used to say osmosis a lot, too, but I don't now. When everyone uses it. <laughs> by usage, I feel, somehow. But our old enemy on the wall is not our friend at the moment. Time is running out. 
I've been close to tears a few times tonight. <laughs> I've, I've had a lot of moods and I've shared them with you and I've been as frank as I possibly can. Michael, were you going to ask me something? Please. Michael Aspel? As one of the most enlightened and influential people of our time, do you ever feel just a moment of self-doubt? Self-doubt? <laughs> I must say it's not easy to associate me with self-doubt, is it, possums? I seem so upfront, don't I? I do. But you know, Dame Curie, so many people in the world of entertainment and politics and, and religion too know that we all have our moments when we're on our knees and we're thinking, what's it all about, you know? Can I carry this on my own? Can't I share it? And I have those moments, I do. <laughs> you've probed me, you've put your finger on it there. You know, <laughs> since this little eminent musician, little Laurie Holloway, has seated himself at my Elizabeth Arden pink grand, <laughs> I feel a song coming on. I'll just look over your shoulder and get the words. I suppose you think you know me pretty well now. And you can tell now what makes me tick. I'm not a mystery anymore. You've penetrated every pore. You know what turns me on and you know what makes me sick. <laughs> Tonight I've been quizzed by some pretty rude and surly ones. And you've thrown me some curly ones below the belt. But I'm not the girl I seem and I just have to let off steam because it's time I told you how I've always felt. You can't judge me, possums, by the looks of me. You'd be amazed if you probed the vulnerable nooks of me. You see, I'm shy, I can hardly look these cameras in the eye. What a paradoxical mechanism am I? From the day I was born, I've been deeply withdrawn in hell. To have to force myself to come out of my shell. But I'm like Shirley Bassey and you'd never tell. Some of you think I'm a cold, hard-voiced woman But I'm here to say I'm a warm And fundamentally moist woman <laughs> Though I'm the rage I hyperventilate Each time I go on stage And I flush more than most women on my
Quand j'ai appris que vous étiez là, je suis venu immédiatement à Londres. C'était plus facile que d'aller en Australie. Je suis tellement heureux de vous rencontrer. Ma chère Edna. Does that mean I'm in the common market? It is. Is it audience? Flowers for you. Oh, you darling. You're enough. I don't need these blooms. You gorgeous man. Look at you. Come specially to see me. Specially. Do you know I dream about you, Charles? I do. <laughs> And you've got so much panache. You're so bold. You're so confident, aren't you? No, no, not exactly, you know. <laughs> Do I intimidate you? Look, as we say in French, I'm je suis terriblement timide. You can't see it because you know everything is pink here, but I'm pink too. You blush? <laughs> yes, terribly. I'm, I'm shy. You're shy uh, too. I'm shy. Yes, I'm shy. <laughs> I'm shy. And now could make me an extremely happy guy. I only wish I was an extra meter. Hi. <laughs> we would both, how you say, dance in the old-fashioned way, can we? Oh. Yeah. You are back. This is my heaven, you are. Yeah. You are back. Oh. This wasn't especially planned. Some people fight against their shyness. We. Pretty Clinton boy George, to name a few. <laughs> But I recently told her Royal Highness. Yes. I said, believe it or not, I'm shy too. But I must confess that I've felt slightly better since. This little Gallic possum helped me sublimate my natural red. <laughs> <laughs> Convicted of murder and awaiting D-Day, Kevin Spacey and Kate Winslet star in our movie The Life of David Gale later at nine. But before ITV3 goes movie mad, Ruth Rendell's The Orchard Wall is next.